This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay, so good morning everyone and thanks for coming. Most of you know me, but I'm going to briefly introduce myself. I'm Andreas Kallagoropoulos. I'm a, a faculty with the Heart Failure Research Program, originally from Greece. Uh, I'm board certified in my home country. I uh, did some postdoc work here in the Echo Lab first and the Heart Failure Program afterwards. Did a Master in Public Health. I uh, gathered a lot of credentials, as you can see. One thing that I like to tell is that the number of credentials you have does not correlate statistically with your salary, but it's good you have like a long, um, uh, a long trail of credentials to present. And I joined faculty here at Emory in 2010. My uh, areas of research are echocardiography and heart failure. Uh, I, I would like to start right away. Uh, the topic today is uh, right ventricular failure after elvant implantation, but I would like to discuss a little bit before the broader scope of uh, uh, mechanical circulatory support as a long-term therapy for advanced heart failure today. And these are my disclosures, uh, mostly it's uh, federal funding and support, so there are no direct conflict of interest related to this topic. And these are the things that I would like to discuss uh, with you today, go through the scope of uh, uh, ELVA therapy as destination uh, therapy, and then discuss the problems of right ventricular failure. Why is it important? What are the current approaches and some future uh, directions? I always like to start with this broader epidemiological slide of uh, heart failure. This stems from the original designation of uh, stages of heart failure by the 200, 2005 guidelines. The point here is as we move from uh, risk factors to preclinical, clinical and then advanced heart failure, the complexity of treatment and the cost increases. So that's why it's important to intervene as early as possible. As this slide from the original 2005 guidelines where the heart failure stages were designated mentions, when the patient reaches stage D, you may have heard the term also advanced, refractory, or the most like fearsome term, end stage, we need extraordinary measures. And I would like to stress here that what we are going to talk about today are problems of luxury. So I gave a talk on advanced heart failure uh, six months ago in my home country, Greece, and what I stress to the audience is that for 99 plus, 99 plus percent of the world, the main option is this one on the top, nothing. There are no palliative care programs, and in most places uh, in the world, uh, and our own David Markham, who does a lot of humanitarian work, knows that, have absolutely nothing to do with these options, like implantation of a device as a bridge to transplant, or as destination therapy, or as a bridge to decision. So. Uh, so this term that it's mostly a marketing term that has been coined some time ago for heart transplant or a mechanical circulatory support, I would like to stress that it, it's still a marketing term, cardiac replacement therapy. I'm like, okay. So this is where, as uh, Larry Allen mentioned uh, uh, a few months ago, giving grand rounds here, where the marketing perspective of uh, the healthcare system sometimes overwhelms pa patients and we convey the wrong message. So having said that, what is the potential pool of patients who might be eligible for uh, mechanical circulatory support as long term? Obviously, everything is a ballpark estimate, but based on some assumptions in this classic paper by Miller and Googling, we estimate that the pool of patients between 150 and 150,000 patients in the United States. Now, what exactly is advanced heart failure is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. We did some review work with an excellent student here at Emory. He's now uh, in the University of Minnesota doing his residency, Jonathan Bjork, and we published this in uh, the Journal of Cardiac Failure. Depending on the scope of, or, or, or the purpose and the scope of the trial, the criteria for advanced heart failure in the various clinical trials were widely different, which uh, 
understates the problem that we don't probably have a single definition of advanced heart failure and we tailor it depending on um, uh, on the clinical application. Like it's different when we talk about selection for advanced therapies versus say uh, uh, inclusion in a clinical trial or, or other purposes. One thing that we became, uh, our team uh, uh, has become interested in is what is the rate of progression to advanced heart failure, and this is the, the paper I was talking uh, with some of you before. So we look at almost a thousand patients here at Emory who were receiving outpatient care for systolic heart failure using some uh, widely accepted cutoff for ejection fraction, 40%, and, you look, and we looked at clinically defined transition to advanced heart failure over the next three years. Again, this is clinically defined, which means it's somewhat subjective, but we also have work showing that whenever a clinician here at Emory says it is advanced heart failure in the patient, it should be considered uh, as an advanced heart failure patient for, for therapies, for advanced therapies or palliative measures, they're mostly right. So we found that over the course of three years, a combined 25% of stable patients with systolic heart failure will transition to either stage D heart failure or will die. So actually, one out of eight patients approximately will transition to advanced heart failure, and one out of eight patients will die. These are two competing events. That's how we, uh, we analyze it. So one out of four patients will have uh, trouble within the next three years. And we identified the set of risk factors. The reason this is still uh, it's provisionally accepted. The journal asked us to create a score for clinical use, and we were really pleased about it. It means uh, people value our work, and they think this is uh, a usable thing from a clinical perspective. Okay, the patient has reached, uh, let's suppose that we have reached a consensus, the patient has reached advanced heart failure. What are the options? So, as I mentioned before, for 90 percent of patients in the world, there are no options, and uh, even in this system here, the options that we're talking about probably apply to less than 10% of the patients. Most of the patients will just get palliative care. Uh, so among available therapies, heart transplant is limited by the number of uh, donor hearts and strict criteria. So we are left with a single option, which is mechanical circulatory support uh, as, uh, as long-term therapy. Heart transplant has excellent outcomes in the long term, especially if someone overcomes the, the complications of uh, the first year and uh, immediate rejection. But as I mentioned before, we are stuck with the number of donor hearts, which doesn't seem to increase. So the option that we are left with is the metal heart, as I call it. So it's funny. I was a fan of this German rock band back, back in the 80s. Yes, I used to be a youngster some, uh, at some point. And the artist, of, uh, uh, the artist uh, there, this is how they imagine, like, the, the, the metal heart, the, the mechanical heart. And this is the reality today. It's, uh, uh, it's quite different. So we have reached a point w w where we have really implantable and, Im and, most importantly, portable devices, something that the patient can live with and carry with. Uh, most of you remember that the initial generation, the first generation of devices, uh, was not was bulkier. The batteries were bulkier, so it was difficult to live on the device. That has changed a lot, and with the results of the pivotal HeartMate to destination therapy trial, it was proven that the continuous flow devices, which is the current approach to uh, left ventricular assist devices, provide better outcomes compared to older pulsatile flow devices. Are more durable and have a lower rate of complications. Although, as we discussed, not exactly low. It's unlikely that you will see today a placebo-controlled or medical therapy-controlled uh, trial in these patients because it's well established that survival-wise, there is a huge advantage with left ventricular assist devices. This is beautiful work from the pilot hardware trial in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. They projected the survival of these patients using the CL heart failure model. It's beautiful. You see, at two years, the actual survival was double of what was projected with uh, the Seattle heart failure model on medical therapy. The current outcomes, according to the latest Indermax report, which is a registry that collects data on long-term mechanical circulatory support in the States, data demonstrate that at this point, we have reached uh, a two-year survival of 70% plus. And as you uh, can appreciate here, 
it's a little bit better for patients who are breathed to transplant implants because, by definition, these patients are in better shape. Exactly because for a patient to be a destination therapy paper, pa patient from the outset means they're not eligible for transplant, which means, in turn, that they're in a little worse shape. But still, pretty good outcomes compared to medical therapy. So this is where we stand at this point, and we do know that this comes, uh, that the uh, Elvan therapy comes also with improved quality of life and uh, compares reasonably well with transplantation for those patients uh, uh, who, who can get uh, this uh, option. And as the technology improves, and we know now that the HeartMate 3 device is producing good results in, in terms of thrombosis, uh, the population pool for these devices may grow. However, if you look at the uh, at the latest Intermax report, these are three quarters worth of last year. Uh, the data for the entire year are not uh, out yet. As you see, the trend has curved a little bit. It was projected that it will exceed 3,000 devices this year. It will not. And I believe the reason is that the New England Journal of Medicine paper talking about uh, uh, increased rate of thrombosis compared to what we expected from clinical trials has created some alertness regarding the downsides of uh, left ventricular assist device as destination therapy. And I believe this mostly has triggered a lot of uh, decision-making discussion with the patient, as Larry Allen mentioned, like some, uh, a few months ago here. And the major driver for this increase is, as you can see with the green bars, starting from here, the implants as destination uh, therapy. This is the major driver for device increase. As I mentioned before, we were privileged enough to have the leader of the University of Colorado group talked to us a few months ago about uh, the work they're doing in conveying the pros and cons of these uh, devices to the patients. As you can see here, they have developed beautiful patient-oriented materials to give a sense of what is expected in terms of survival, but importantly, what is expected here in terms of communications. And as you can see here, on uh, obviously, a lot of patients will get hospitalized. In our database, it's like... Okay. You think it's going to work better? Okay. So, as you can see here, survival is much better compared to medical therapy, but most of the patients will end in the hospital. Actually, our data show and others' data show that the number is a little bit higher than this, and there are going to be some devastating complications, and this is a problem we're going to talk about. One out of five patients will have ongoing heart failure because of right ventricular failure. So in this beautiful uh, review work from the same group, they have shown that right ventricular failure is one of the most frequent complications, and I want to focus a little bit on this complication because you literally get stuck with it. There are some complications that are manageable, some superficial infections, uh, some arrhythmias are manageable. The problem with right ventricular failure is that you get stuck with it and defeats the purpose of implanting the device because it leads to a worse quality of life. It doesn't, or to put it otherwise, quality of life doesn't improve as much, which is a, which is a primary goal, and also increases costs a lot. So I am Greek, so I like to use a lot of Greek mythology. I call right ventricular failure the Achilles skill of uh, left ventricular assist uh, device uh, therapy. The problem with right ventricular failure is that it's not quite predictable. For example, in the upper two slides, you can see a patient who started really well in terms of right ventricular function, but things uh, went uh, downhill afterwards. And then on the lower two slides, you can see a patient who started with poor function, but a few months later, they did, uh, the right ventricle really did uh, take up and, uh, and work better. So it's, it's a difficult beast to predict for various reasons that we're going to discuss. And the, the Intermax group has set some criteria for defining right uh, heart failure. Uh, this is the latest iteration, but it has been pretty much the same for the, for the past several years. To call it right ventricular failure, you need some evidence of elevated uh, right atrial pressures and some manifestations in terms of edema or damage to, to target organs uh, including the kidney uh, and the liver. Now, to call it heart failure, obviously, you have uh, to be forced to give treatment for heart failure, and they have defined these levels of severity 
ranging from mild right heart failure where you need a few days of post-op inner drops to severe right uh, heart failure where you need mechanical circulatory support or leads to, to, to patient's death. And we have discussed this before with a lot of clinicians here at Emory. Sometimes it's difficult to adjudicate how much right ventricular failure contributed to, to post-op complications where you have a vicious circle uh, including low blood pressure and organ damage, worse right ventricular failure, because sometimes there is, it is unclear whether you have a septic complication, it's right ventricular failure, what exactly contributes to hypotension, and it absolutely can be both, like a septic, uh, a septic situation and right ventricular failure, which actually exaggerates uh, uh, each other. A practical definition that has been used by a lot of groups uh, is calling right ventricular failure, one, uh, uh, call it, call it uh, right ventricular failure when we have unplanned need for mechanical circulatory support, prolonged use of inotropes, most groups have used two weeks as the cutoff point to call it right ventricular failure, exactly because a lot of patients are taking inotropes post-op, need prolonged need for pulmonary vasodilations, but vasodilators, but this is, is, is a, with a question mark and we'll discuss in a while why, and obviously uh, when it's clear that the uh, uh, patient died because of uh, right uh, heart failure. Now we have, now that we have patients living up to five years or more with the destination therapy, we, think we have a new animal to deal with, rate, late right heart failure. Initially the concern was around the first 60 to 90 days. There are data from Columbia showing that almost no patient needed uh, uh, immediate support after elvanibladation beyond 60 days. So we used to call right uh, heart failure, uh, failure of the right ventricle within the 60 or 90 days. Now it has become a little bit more complicated because some patients develop uh, late right ventricular failure as a result of disease progression and we need somehow to define uh, the so-called stages of right ventricular failure of phases. We did this review work with uh, Javed Butler and uh, David Markham some time ago and the rate of right ventricular failure after elven implantation ranged from practically 20 to 40 percent depending on the on the definition, the stricter the definition, obviously, uh, the lower rate of uh, right ventricular failure. But until today, with the most common uh, uh, definition, which is need for mechanical circulatory support for the right ventricle or prolonged use of pinotropes, most groups report 20 to 30 percent, and our experience is around 25 uh, percent. Pardon? Now, why is it so important? Why are we focusing on it? So it comes with a lot of problems attached. Leads to reduced survival, and for those who are bridged to transplant, leads to less progression to transplant. It leads to worse outcomes after heart transplant. It's associated with significant higher rates of healthcare resource utilization. Uh, a group demonstrated that patients who developed right ventricular failure uh, need to stay in the ICU to ice as patients without right heart failure. And also, it's associated with uh, long-term exercise, uh, poor exercise capacity and quality of life. As I mentioned before, this actually defeats the purpose of having an LVAD uh, in the first place. We know from the Intermax data that having the need for right ventricular support from the outset, it's already a bad sign. So if you need some mechanical uh, support for both ventricles, survival is considerably lower compared to need for LVAD alone. In the HeartMate 2 Bristol Transplant uh, trial, <coughs> Cormos and colleagues demonstrated that right ventricular failure is associated with 20 uh, percentage points less survival at one year, like 78 percent to 59 percent. This is a considerable difference in survival rates at one year. The Columbia group has done a lot of work on right ventricular failure and they have a number of publications demonstrate the epidemiology and, and outcomes of these complications. They have shown that patients who need their uh, right ventricular assist device have significantly less survival uh, at one year and importantly this doesn't differ much whether uh, the decision is made <coughs> before or after. Like, 
the difference between plant versus bailout left right ventricular assist device is not that much and they have a beautiful publication demonstrating this clearly that patients who would receive the device as a bailout and failed to win from the device had really poor outcomes as you can see here even at six months survival was really low so it's so when the patient has severe right ventricular failure and they need a device it's a problem uh, uh, this group uh, demonstrated, I can't remember wh uh, what this group is, uh, uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's from Yale. They demonstrated that the definition of uh, severe right uh, heart failure as proposed by Indermax, uh, it does play a role. We always had this question whether uh, right ventricular failure is different like uh, uh, in terms of impact on outcomes when you have Okay, so we always had this question whether it's different when the patient needs a right ventricular assist device or they just have prolonged need for inotropes. So this is a small study, but it did demonstrate a difference. Like the usual thing that patients need uh, a lot of inotropes uh, in hospital and uh, they have a prolonged stay is not as bad as the need for right ventricular assist devices. It's a small study, but I find it very uh, encouraging for, for uh, in terms of outcomes and prognosis. Now, as I mentioned before, the Columbia Group has done most of the work uh, in uh, right ventricular failure, and they looked at late ventricular failure. There is ongoing, there is, because there is disease progression, especially in patients with uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a lot of patients will develop right heart failure later. And as I mentioned before, it's a difficult beast to deal with because you're stuck with. And they have demonstrated that, that even five years out of implantation, right heart failure is associated with worse outcomes. Again, these are small studies, but are, this is, I feel that this is important uh, information. In fact, they have found that uh, this affects uh, the uh, both the destination and the bridge to transplant uh, groups, but it does affect a lot the bridge to transplant group. Remember, we discussed that. It also affects post-transplant uh, outcomes. So why does the right ventricle fail after left ventricular assist device implantation? There are three main domains of problems here. One is, all of a sudden, the right ventricle has to deal with increased preload because now the left ventricle or the device, if you may, works better. So it has to, uh, to step up to the plate, and this doesn't always happen because there's a certain limit where you overload a failing light, uh, right ventricle and you go to the other, the downhill slope of the Frank Starling curve. Also, although the afterload comes down after l implantation, like uh, pulmonary pressures come down because the component of pulmonary vascular resistance that has to do with uh, elevated pressures and reactive pulmonary protection does go down. And there are at least uh, four groups that have shown that, including ours. Actually, ours was the first group to show that with uh, non-invasive measures. It does go down, but it doesn't go down immediately. It takes time. So within that window, the right ventricle has to face elevated preload and still elevated afterload. And also, there is a conundrum of uh, the interventricular interaction, which is a conundrum because the, the septum doesn't behave the same in healthy patients versus patients with uh, cardiomyopathy. And uh, it's, uh, it's also difficult to image. I have done some echo work on this and, and others. So it's difficult to image uh, uh, the right ventricle and measure the contribution of uh, the septum to right ventricular work. In this beautiful study, I think it's uh, one of the few studies that have managed to do this. They have ma the authors have manipulated the, the hardware device in patients who had uh, who were implanted with the uh, with a hardware device and compared patients with a normal right ventricle and those who had an impaired right ventricle from the beginning. The problem was when they ramped up uh, the device, they co uh, the, the patients with uh, poor functioning right ventricle developed suction easier than patients with, uh, and had more arrhythmic events compared to patients who had a normal right ventricle. Which brings the next question, how predictable is the right ventricle? So I'm gonna say this upfront. 
we may be able to predict who's going to develop right ventricular failure, but it's difficult to predict who's not going to, which means we can have a high positive predictive value uh, based on imaging and clinical information, but it's difficult to have a high negative predictive value, meaning there are events during surgery and after surgery, depending on the setting of this device, that can lead a patient with a decently working right ventricle before to still have right ventricular failure, while the opposite is difficult. When we have a failing, a badly failing right ventricle before, uh, it's unlikely that a miracle will happen. That's why I'm saying you can have a high predictive value. You know that this patient is going to develop probably bad right ventricular failure, but it's difficult to tell that this patient is absolutely not going to have right ventricular failure. Uh, and we, we did have patients uh, on both uh, sides. There have been some prediction models uh, uh, from clinical trials and other registries trying to predict uh, right ventricular failure. It's mostly a set of criteria encompassing uh, some form of right ventricular fu function, uh, systolic function, a measure of right ventricular cellular function, for example, uh, right ventricular stroke work, work index has been used, or uh, uh, cardiac index, or inotrope dependency. And then it's a combination of renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction, a combination of these risk factors. And there, are, there have been some score systems that have been developed. Some of these systems have been developed in the pulsatile flow era, and in, within an era of uh, older surgical uh, techniques. We have found in this uh, uh, publication with David Vega and Javed Butler that most of the models don't work well in our population, which was mostly, which was uh, consisting of continuous flow devices. And others have found, have similar results that the prediction models don't work well. This is some recent work from Carnegie Mellon and UPMC. Uh, this is very interesting work. Instead of relying on a set of risk factors, they threw everything they had at the machine uh, and used the machine learning algorithm to see whether they could predict right uh, ventricular failure from the Intermax database. They have found that when they use machine learning algorithms and uh, an infinite combination of uh, risk factors in terms of how the factors fit in the model, they could achieve very high area under the curve in uh, in prediction of right ventricular failure. You can see here that for early right ventricular failure, the area under the curve is almost 90%, which is unreal for a clinical model, with a very high uh, specific specificity reaching almost 100%, which means you can really tell uh, who's not going to develop, uh, develop uh, right ventricular failure. As I mentioned before, this is clinically, a little, uh, clinically, it's hard to believe. Now, this group is trying to make this uh, a clinically usable tool similar to the Seattle heart failure model, like using an interactive uh, website. But uh, that's my opinion. I find it difficult to believe that we can predict right ventricular failure with such high accuracy from clinical data, from pre-op data, because of the issues that I mentioned before. The analogy here is prediction of uh, response to cardiac restriction therapy. You can do very sophisticated echo before you can define the sites of uh, uh, latest activation. But the thing is, if things don't go well during implantation and you paste like a random site, it's unlikely that you can have good results. And what happens during implantation or mishappenings during implantation, that you cannot predict. So I don't really believe that we can predict with such high negative predictive value the, the occurrence of right ventricular failure. But as I mentioned before, there are a set of risk factors that have been used, a combination of uh, parameters from right heart cath and clinical factors. What has not been used that much in clinical models is echocardiographic predictors. Now, this is not a coincidence. The problem is that to have consistent results, you have to have a consistent echo protocols protocol and high quality echo in all patients to be able to generate uh, a model and for groups to collaborate together and have a multi-center uh, registry including echo, it's a humongous task that has been proven time and again to have consistent echocardiography among various centers has uh, proven and challenged many times. So there has been a lot of echo work trying to 
to incorporate echo predictors in models predicting right ventricular failure for clinical purposes, but these models have come up with a lot of different factors uh, and parameters, some of which are not routinely used in clinical practice, and the parameters that ended up in the model were not consistent anyways. So this is totally unfortunate, and you know this is going to happen when you present, some videos are not going to play. I don't know why PowerPoint asks permissions. It does have a lot of permissions, but it won't play. This is really bad. Usually, where we start looking at the right ventricle is the apical dedicated right ventricular view, which allows for a good visualization of both the septum and the right ventricular wall. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to visualize the right ventricular free wall, especially in patients with dilated ventricles, but our lab does a pretty consistent uh, work. And we do measure a certain number of uh, parameters to, uh, to evaluate, to examine the function of the right ventricle, and I'm going to discuss some pros and cons. The tapes, uh, which is just the excursion of the tricuspid annulus during systole, has been used a lot. But there is a certain problem in patients imaged before left ventricular assist device implantation. In our center, most of the patients are in their max classes 2 and 3, meaning these patients are on inotropes, under stress, and some of the patients are going really uh, downhill. So most of the patients are stressed at high heart rates and hemodynamic stress. This can lead to the right ventricle dancing a lot, but not actually contracting, which means when you're using a linear measure like TAPSE, you see a lot of mo movement, you see high TAPSE, but this does not translate to actual right ventricular contraction, so it can be deceptive. The same goes for tissue Doppler measure of tricuspid annulus velocities. It's a good measure of right ventricular systolic function in stable patients, I don't think it's a good measure in patients imaged, say, two or three days before a left ventricular assist device implantation with the goal to assess right ventricular function, exactly because there is a lot of movement. You can see patients who uh, have uh, systolic velocity above the nominal value of 10 centimeters per second, and still the right ventricular function is not good. Also, you can use the same trace to, me to measure the uh, right index of myocardial performance, RIMP, which is supposedly a combined measure of systolic and diastolic function. Again, in patients uh, imaged under stress, it's difficult to have accurate, uh, accurate measurements. I haven't found it to be uh, very useful, useful to, to be honest. Another measure that, another measure that has been widely used uh, in stable patient is the fraction area change. It's very simple. It's like ejection fraction in two dimensions. You measure the right ventricular area in diastole and then in systole. Our lab does a pretty consistent work in measuring uh, right ventricular fraction and area change, and her, there has been good correlation with uh, MRI right ventricular ejection fraction. As a reminder, there is no such a thing as right ventricular ejection fraction with echo as of this day. Sure, there are some three-dimensional algorithms, but it's still far from perfect. So uh, the American Society of Echo does not recommend calculating right ventricular ejection fraction with echo. So this is the closest you can get to a right ventricular ejection fraction. If you can have an accurate measurement of the endocardial borders, it's pretty accurate. The problem is that in patients under stress, sometimes it's difficult to have accurate delineation of the right ventricle because the image of the, of the right ventricular wall goes in and out of phase as the heart moves rapidly. So when you can, when we have like a clear visualization, it's an accurate measure, uh, but it's not always the case. In fact, our group have found that right ventricular uh, fractional area change, but this is in stable patients, has pretty good prognostic value, and that separates further patients who have heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. The one thing that has group has worked on uh, uh, and we kind of pioneered this work is use of two-dimensional deformation imaging strain, to keep it simple, uh, 
for the right ventricle. We have demonstrated that strain works pretty well for patients who have a systemic uh, right ventricle. So it's prognostic for patients with detransposition of the great uh, arteries and uh, atrial suites. The reason is th there is no real magic about uh, uh, two-dimensional strain, and usually we use the, the longitudinal strain, the global longitudinal strain of uh, the right ventricle, of the systemic ventricle in this case. There's nothing real magic about it. The only thing is it's less subjective because you trace the endocardium, the computer measures it. Ejection fraction can be a little bit more subjective even in a lab with high standards of reproducibility as ours. Also, at some, in some cases, ejection fraction can be deceptive. In fact, the smaller the, the ventricle, the more deceptive ejection fraction can be. The reason is because the denominator is really small, uh, you, can, you can have a high ejection fraction even, th even with low contractility. The prime example is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There has been work uh, done by European labs, including the, the Paramount trial, the Entresto trial in, uh, in HEFPEV, where they demonstrated that half of the patients with preserved uh, systolic function with traditional criteria, they actually had systolic dysfunction when you use uh, longitudinal strain of, uh, of the left ventricle. So it's a more accurate measurement of uh, uh, right ventricular systolic function also. Now, we have uh, developed some standards for uh, uh, right ventricular global strain as a rule of thumb. Anything uh, above 20 is good, between 10 and 20 is problematic, and below 10% you have severe right ventricular dis uh, dysfunction. This is one of the first cases we enrolled in our uh, right ventricular failure trial that is funded by the American Heart Association. This is a pretty interesting case because it demonstrates the, the problems uh, we discussed before. The patient was imaged under stress. Let me see if this can play. No luck. The patient was imaged under stress. So with traditional measures of right ventricular function, you can see here that TDI is kind of OK. Even the rim was kind of OK. It goes 0.54, 55 is considered uh, uh, a, a good cutoff uh, point for the right index of myocardial performance. Yet the patient had very low uh, right ventricular strain. So this patient ended in the ICU for two months with inotropes. I think this is a prime case that demonstrates uh, the problem of using traditional measures in this situation. So is using right ventricular mechanics, which is a fancy term for right ventricular strain, the future? There are at least three other groups, and we are the fourth group that shows that right ventricular strain of the free wall or global, including the septum, we are believers, we are global uh, right ventricular strain believers, but other groups believe that uh, free wall strain is most, more important. So a lot of groups found that the strongest predictor of right ventricular failure among echo parameters is the strain of the free wall of the right ventricle or the global strain of the right ventricle. So we started our own right ventricular failure study uh, several years ago. It uh, initially was funded by the Emory University and ACTSI, uh, and then we received the American Heart Association, Heart Association funding to continue this uh, observational uh, study. Our goal was to see whether we could use high-quality echo, and we have a deep belief, deep faith in our echo lab, to predict right ventricular failure and see how this relates to quality of life also, and whether we can predict recovery of right ventricular function. So the design paper was published in the European uh, Heart Journal Cardiovascular Imaging uh, uh, like a year ago, and we are using both traditional measures of right ventricular function to have like a measure of comparison with previous studies and to have consistency and completeness, and we also add uh, right ventricular mechanics. The criteria for the study are pretty simple. We include every patient that can be reasonably imaged before a left ventricular assist device implantation. That's why we exclude patients who are in their max one, the patient is in shock. He cannot reasonably consent and reasonably undergo baseline 
imaging, but otherwise we only exclude patients who, such, who have such very high pulmonary vascular resistance that is considered a problem anyways in the outset, so we thought it's a problem to include these uh, patients. And as I mentioned, we have standard and uh, mechanics-based echocardiography. So this is our patient population. Uh, that was like, we have like uh, uh, double that population right now, but the demographics are pretty much the same. We mostly implant, implant Intermax 2 and 3 here at Emory, patients on inotropes. And we had, uh, and we still have a healthy balance between various uh, devices. Also, we have a healthy proportion of bridge transplant patients. Other centers have a higher proportion of destination therapy. We are a transplant center, so we maintain this good balance of uh, patients. And these are our preliminary results. What we have found is that what can predict right ventricular failure is a combination of right ventricular function, tricuspid regurgitation, and left ventricular size. In fact, other centers have, have found the same problem with left ventricular size. The thing is that the devices come with a certain size, and some ventricles, and some, even some chambers, uh, even the left atrium, at, at, atrial size plays a role. So some chambers are small for the device. So it's easier to have adverse interventricular interaction, suction effects, and other problems. So a combination of these three factors, size of the left ventricle, tricuspid regurgitation, and a right ventricular strain gave us really good prediction. Of course, it's a sickle center study, and we now have results on 80 patients who are pretty similar, but the question is uh, whether this can be replicated by other centers because a certain center has certain habits, certain ways that doing surgery. I know that David Vega and his colleagues have changed things of how to treat right ventricular failure uh, during the course of the trial and discuss this a little bit. Other teams are doing that also. We also have some serial echo data, and I won't expand much on that. I will give you the main message right away. As I mentioned before, we observed that pulmonary pressures go down, and in fact, we measure uh, pulmonary vascular resistance non-invasively using echocardiography. It's a combination of uh, the pulmonary uh, outflow tract, like the right ventricle outflow tract, and the a TVI of the tricuspid regurgitation. This has been validated in patients with pulmonary hypertension. We are the first group to, to demonstrate that you can non-invasively track uh, right uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance in this patient. It does go down, and it does go down a lot. But as I mentioned before, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't go down immediately. And as you can see here, there is a pretty significant reduction at 30 days, and it's maintained and improved at 90 days, but this may be too late for, for some patients. The interesting thing in, in the serial study was that the linear measures of uh, right ventricular performance, actually, they worsen. So, as is, and this is the effect of, uh, of the stress that I mentioned before. The patients start with a high TAPSE, and you would think that this means worsening because TAPSE goes down by 30 and 90 days, and the same is true for right ventricular uh, TDI velocity, the systolic velocity. The reality is that the function doesn't go down, it's the stress that is going down, so you have a heart that is dancing less. And uh, if you use actually the right ventricular fraction area change, there's a slight improvement. It goes to the opposite direction. And the same goes for the right ventricular myocardial performance index. So we have, so we have traditional measures that go to opposite directions. The ventricular mechanics, though, tell us that there isn't much change in function. And if you think about it, it's difficult to have substantial change in ventricular function like in, uh, in 30 days and even 90 days. As a reminder, nuclear remodeling of the left or the right ventricle, like at the cell level, takes up to six months. So it's unlikely that we have magic on the right ventricle right away. What improves is hemodynamics. And as you can see here, the interplay of hemodynamics with echo parameters is pretty much complex and needs, uh, and needs careful interpretation. Now, is the right ventricular mechanics going to be uh, like the ultimate measure of right ventricular function? We don't have yet 
correlation with outcomes, which is not the case for strain in the left ventricle. For the left ventricle, there are a bunch of studies showing that it's a very good prognostic measure for patients with heart failure after myocardial function. But in this scenario, right ventricular strain, we don't have strong connection with outcomes yet, and especially what happens after implantation. So we don't have the connection between response of right ventricular mechanics and outcomes in these patients, N not yet at least. So what are the current therapeutic approaches to right ventricular failure? Obviously, there are uh, several groups and, uh, and some anesthesia uh, groups working on uh, uh, anesthesia, cardiac anesthesia, have developed this optimization algorithm where you start optimizing every hemodynamic parameter. And obviously, this is beneficial, but there are some groups that have taken a different approach. Why don't treat everyone as right ventricular failure? And I know that David Vega and his team are doing very careful work, and they're carefully using pulmonary vasodilators uh, in most of the patients. They have changed their approach uh, during the course of, uh, of the past uh, few years. And as you can see here, this Australian group found that a lot of patients can tolerate sildenafil, uh, and also uh, pulmonary, uh, other pulmonary vasodilators. I can see which one was used here. So, uh, this one, in this specific, uh, this specific group used Xylopros. So, they were able to put a lot of patients as hemodynamics were improving and as they were tweaking the left ventricular assist device and increased the dose also. And they have found that with this approach, that is using pharmacological therapy, to improve afterload as much as possible and alleviate burden of the right ventricle, they had very low RVF rates. Now, whether this is uh, uh, a good approach, we need to test it prospectively uh, in some form of a trial, but you found it very interesting. And if you ask me, it doesn't hurt. If you can control hemodynamics and be careful with the medications, it, it doesn't hurt, except for cost, obviously. Now, this paper from the Cleveland group, this, this paper, comes from Cleveland Clinic Engineers. I found this paper <clears throat> very intriguing, and if you have time, uh, I invite everyone to read this very interesting paper. So, this paper explains nicely why the current left ventricular assist devices are not good right ventricular assist devices. And that has been a problem. We only have temporary support for the right ventricle in the form of uh, uh, transcatheter devices, which are expensive. And uh, there are also some from the outset, you can have a buyback, but for bailout support, it becomes a problem, uh, as I have, uh, I have mentioned before. This slide demonstrates beautifully why a left ventricular assist device is not a really good right ventricular assist device. The problem is that left ventricular assist devices have been designed to generate within a specific spectrum of power, meaning they are designed to maintain a certain speed to provide flow against a certain pressure. When you have very much lower pressures to work against, when you put these devices in the right circulation, then you have the problem of generating too much flow for the power, which means you overload the right ventricle, or you have to turn down the device a lot the speed. But the problem is then you have thrombosis problem, meaning the devices have been designed to create flow and wash at certain speed against a certain pressure. To maintain low flow, you have either to create something special for the out outflow graft, meaning to artificially increase resistance or turn the device lower. So there are a lot of technical details, but it's a very intriguing paper and has a lot of physiologic understanding. So the bottom line, this group has put some specific criteria of what would be an ideal design of a dedicated long-term right ventricular assist device. And I find, I, I really find it very uh, interesting. So the bottom line is that you need a lot of surgical techniques to use uh, a left ventricular assist device as a, in, in, uh, in the right heart. I will conclude by just giving future uh, directions uh, for research. For one, we need uh, to reach a consensus definition for right ventricular failure. As I mentioned before, Indermax has been slightly changing this definition over time. It has been stable for the past few iterations, which means we now have a set of criteria that includes 
elevated right atrial pressure, hepatic and renal dysfunction, and then need for therapy, which seems to, to be reaching like a consensus definition right now. We need to standardize echo acquisition in echo labs so that we can use our echo findings consistently across centers and generate multi-center data and incorporate this into prediction models. And also, at some point, you will need to have prospective multi-center studies, not just registers like Intermax, with detailed data. And also, we need to test some strategies for right ventricular uh, failure <coughs> prospectively. And with this, uh, I will thank uh, Dr. Andy Smith, who's not here today, Dr. David Vegard for their support uh, to my work. And thank you all, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, questions for Dr. Galogaropoulos, please. Anyone? One, one of the things that we observed, and you addressed this with respect to these very complicated echo uh, algorithms, is when, a, when, when you develop these very interesting and very complex uh, echo measurement systems, particularly in single labs, and you try to translate them across a number of labs, they, they don't work either because of the technical complexity of obtaining the studies. Our experience in, with resynchronization in a multi-center trial totally destroyed, mm -hmm. uh, destroyed, that, destroyed yes. that. And so it's something that we've got to be very, very careful with, that uh, what works at one place doesn't work at another. And you have to ask the question, is it working at one place because of absolute technical expertise, or is it working at that place because it reflects a bias of the institution? We don't know the answer. The, uh, uh, I mean... You're absolutely on spot with this observation. I was going to mention the CRT experience in terms of <laughs> consistency across centers. I know Emory has been part of it. Uh, the only positive side th that I see is that advanced heart failure centers that are uh, accredited to do uh, long-term mechanical circulatory support usually have good expertise in echo labs. That's the only positive side that there may be uh, some potential to collaborate and be consistent, uh, at least across centers of excellence, to produce something that may be used and translated by other centers, who still are mostly our centers with a lot of expertise. That's the only positive side that I, I can see. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, just, just a note, many of you over the weekend uh, probably received an email from Bob Taylor regarding uh, your, if, if you want to add your name to a list of academic faculty that are uh, expressing their views on current events, and, and I would encourage you to do so. Uh, on a personal note, uh, and if you oblige me, 50 years ago I came to this country and I've been very fortunate to have tremendous opportunity to get to where I am today. The American people opened their homes and their hearts to us, and it is because of that that I stand in front of you today as in a prominent position in a leading academic medical center, and I hope that that opportunity doesn't go away for those that follow me, and I thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.